to me Talk to me Talk to me. Talk to me. That's right. Welcome, New Mexico, to Dialogue, KSFR's Friday evening call in show, where the conversation starts with you. I'm your host, MK, and joining me is my co host, the one and only Nigel, and here for a great show. That's right. And we have got a very special show for you today because we've brought in a truly extraordinary guest. In fact, I would go so far as to say he may be the most important person I have ever had the pleasure of interviewing. He's one of the nation's leading experts in psychiatry, and he's going to help us shed light on a very unfortunately grim topic, and that is the growing phenomenon of mass shootings. As you all know, we experienced one of our own last week in Aztec, New Mexico, that took the lives of three of our young people, two victims, and the shooter himself. And not long before that, right here in Santa Fe, one of our own local high schools, there were three students who were discovered to have been in the potential planning stages of a mass shooting of their own with an official kill list. 2017 was deemed the deadliest year for mass shootings in modern history, with 331 mass shootings in this year alone, and the U.S. leads the world in mass shootings. According to Scientific American, from 1983 to 2013, there were 119 mass shootings around the world. 66% of those were in the United States. The second leading country was Germany, where only seven shootings occurred. Clearly, this is a prevalently American phenomenon. Phenomenon. Of course, the prevailing question is always what drives a human being to this act. And while we want to blame it on one issue or another, one has to imagine that there are a variety of contributing factors from guns to violent video games and clearly mental health. But there's one component you will often find left out in the conversation over mental health, health and that is the potential role of psychiatric drugs. So we've de- decided to dedicate this show to exactly that topic and how these drugs can and in fact have played a part in some of these gruesome events. So the question is, why aren't we hearing about it and what role can they play exactly? Um, I'm going to step away for one moment right now because I want to play a rare clip that you will actually hear from CNN, Sanjay Gupta, and he's bearing testimony that these drugs are worthy of acknowledgement in their contribution to mass shootings. We still don't know much about the shooter who lived in this home, uh, but there is something else to consider. What medications, if any, he was on. I'm specifically talking about antidepressants. If you look at the studies on other shootings like this that have happened, medications like this were a common factor. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that antidepressants can't be effective, but people seem to agree that there is a vulnerable time when someone starts these medications and when someone stops. could lead to increased impulsivity, decreased judgment, and making someone out of touch. None of this is an excuse, and it's never just one thing. None of these behaviors will fully predict or explain why. But soon again, there will be hindsight that might just help prevent another tragedy. It's worth pointing out over a seven-year period, there were 11,000 episodes of violence related to drug side effects. If there was a death involved, often it was the individual himself or herself, uh, a suicide. It is very difficult for many of these people to get treatment in the first place. And that is Sanjay Gupta himself bearing testimony to the fact that these drugs do influence and can play a a critical role in some of these mass shootings. But you're not going to hear about that. That was a rare event, and I wanted to to bring that up and and share that with you uh, so that we really understand that, that this is not a fringe idea. This is... Uh, based on scientific evidence, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's look at the use of these drugs. In recent years, the number of Americans on antidepressants has doubled. Now 20% of our population is taking psychiatric drugs, most of which are women. Anxiety drug overdoses have quadrupled over the last two decades, and Abilify, a well-known second-generation antipsychotic, continues to be not only among the top prescribed drugs in this country, but the one with the highest sales at nearly $6.9 billion. And Big Pharma continues to rank among the top 
of the list for mass media ad revenue. And this is probably why we'll never hear San- Sanjay Gupta talk about this again or why we're not hearing about it. But we're going to talk to our guest about that. And uh, I want to mention he's joining us today to help us look at the exact scientific nature of how these drugs work. And he is Harvard-trained, longtime author, medical legal expert, Peter, Dr. Peter Bregan, and one of the nation's, if not the nation's, leading psychiatrists in understanding the actual clinical nature of these drugs. He has his own radio show, which is one of the most popular on the Progressive Radio Network, called the Dr. Peter Bregan Hour. He's been featured on Oprah, 60 Minutes, 2020, Larry King Live, to name only a few, and been involved in a number of the highest profile mass shootings in this, cases in this country. Um, I'm going to let him expound on that. And he's authored over 20 books including Talking Back to Prozac. He also has consistently published countless peer-reviewed articles. His reform work was primarily responsible for leading the international campaign to stop the resurgence of the lobotomy and newer forms of psychosurgery. The FDA's recent recognition of numerous adverse reactions caused by the new antidepressants, including suicidality in children and young adults, closely follows observations made and publicized by Dr. Bregan over the past 10 years. And without further ado, I would like to introduce and welcome the man who has been properly called the conscience of psychiatry, Dr. Peter Bregan. It's an honor to have you with us. After that, I better find my stuffy voice. (laughs) (laughs) MK, I just loved meeting you and talking with you on the air earlier. And, uh, folks, she's going to be on my radio show, so it shows you my respect for her um, in the coming months. In fact, she was going to be on uh, in January, but I have to go to testify on behalf of a man who um, killed his infant while on huge doses of uh, Wellbutrin and... um, Effects or and uh, so I, I can't say anything more about it than that because there will be a trial. But um, well, wow. the uh, I've been involved in multiple multiple trials about this, and I, I want to mention one book, not to promote the book, but the information absolutely that is exactly about this show, and that's Medication Madness. The uh, subtitle is The Role of Psychiatric Drugs in Violence, Suicide, and Crime. So it's about the show today, Medication Madness. And the other thing that I'm so proud of is the Sanjay Gupta uh, quote that you have, because the only reason it exists, I believe, is because I had taken that day off. That was the day of the terrible shootings in Connecticut where these little children were were so brutally murdered. And... Um, I was watching uh, CNN and Fox and anything else I could, and I can't, and I heard Sanjay make these remarks, and I think he made them because he was just, it was the honesty of facing this disaster and catastrophe to let him speak like that. Yeah. And I called my assistant, who's in another state, and I said, can you get back and capture this somehow, capture this? And he did. And that's why we have it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's on the Internet, because I've never seen it anywhere else except borrowed from from me and, and the capture we made. So I'm very pleased that you got that. And um, we had another that next day, I think, a, a similar quote from the, the uh, head of Homeland Security uh, making a similar quote. We captured that one, too. And they're the only two out there, as far yeah. as I know. So there's a huge, huge push to ignore this issue and and what to never you, mention it to never mention it and what do you attribute this to drug company power over the whole world <laughs> in the simple terms com- excuse me i said in simple terms right oh yeah very simple terms i used to call it the psychopharmaceutical complex now i'm just calling it the pharmaceutical empire mm-hmm. um we have now this multi, it's probably in the trillions of dollars, of uh, power resting in the hands of corporations that make all kinds of medications and often all kinds of chemicals uh, that are pollutants as well. They have enormous power that they wield over the media. 
And um, in particular, ever since, uh, something that I originally favored, because I'm very libertarian, I favored people being able to advertise for medications on television. I didn't see any reason why not to do that years ago. But it is actually with the beginning of that, when psychiatric medications could be advertised on television and radio, that access to television and radio all but dried up to anybody who had anything critical to say. For example, you mentioned uh, earlier that I'd been on uh, the most powerful radio shows and television shows at the time, Oprah Winfrey five Mm -hmm. times or more. Um, and just I've been on everything. You can't name anything. I, I wasn't on. But once once these stations started taking money from the drug companies, that began to dry up, not just for me, but for everybody. Because since I started it with my book, Toxic Psychiatry, but in the early 90s, but since then, uh, many, many people now have been doing great work. Peter Gertze, mm-hmm. uh, who is a, a physician with the Corcoran um, collaboration, which actually tries to put out good, solid medical research, has been looking at the psychiatric research and is horrified by it. He's written a great book called The Deadly Psychiatry. And uh, he, too, is running into exactly what, even though he he is a much greater part of the establishment, he, too, is running into the same horrific uh, negation of his ability to, to get to the media which is why I have a great website and a radio show and so on and so forth, because I've gone to the web, the Internet, and put up all those videos on YouTube and so on, because that's what we have to do nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and also, and it's interesting, You, I, I heard one of your interviews where you talk about the difference in, in media coverage via television versus radio and how you've had just like millions of viewers on, on radio. They, they're not, have they shut you down on radio, or do you still have that audience? I mean, obviously you have your own radio show, but outside of that, in terms no, of... No, big radio has been, has been mostly shut down as well. Wow. So that um, shows that I've been on in the past, not now. <clears throat> but the, um, this is not just about me. It's anybody who is critical of the psychiatric drugs they those our books don't get reviewed in the new york times and other places washington post it's like this whole segment of criticizing psychiatry um, is uh, forbidden to be expressed to the american people and it truly is Um, it's quite a phenomenon but the internet has grown so so strong i mean um for example, I was the expert in um, another case that was driven by the psychiatric drugs that the press refused to cover, and that was the Michelle Carter case, the, the young woman, 17-year-old, who allegedly told her boyfriend to get into the back into his uh, uh, truck filled with carbon monoxide mm-hmm. and kill himself. Yeah, the, the Ted text by murder case, or murder by text exactly. case, right? Exactly, the text mm-hmm. by murder case which turns out that there's no documentation she ever said that. It's Mm -hmm. something she told a friend, texted a friend two and a half months later, along with many other grandiose and guilty and upset and frightened things she said because she was on antidepressants and so was he. Mm -hmm. So, but that's all, that was hidden from uh, from the media. That's Mm -hmm. another good example. Nobody I talked to who knows about the case knows, knows she was on drugs unless... They saw me uh, somewhere. Now, we had a, this, that was such a fascinating subject that we did have a breakthrough. I had a, I had a whole series of commentaries on uh, 2020 about mm-hmm. the Michelle Carter case. So if it gets sort of, uh, you know, fascinating enough, you can have a bit of a breakthrough. Then I was on HCN, which is an affiliate of um, CNN that, that, you know, is broadcast around mm-hmm. the world. But, um, Doctor, very, very, just, I just wanted very, to ask you very, quickly. Very, yes. Um, sorry, I just want to ask you. Um, in terms of the media shut out and control and everything else, is do you have any experience around the world, like in 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 Europe, the UK, Germany, France, the other countries there? Because I, you know, the 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 media being so controlled and and centrally owned, I. At this point, I mean, is, is is a very American phenomenon. I know, you know, I'm from Canada originally, and they have much tighter controls um, over ho- media ownership and so forth. Um, I would say I've been more shut out in Canada than anywhere. 
Really? <clears throat> in North America, for sure. I used to be on Canadian radio and television all the time. Um, I've been an expert in Canada in really groundbreaking cases uh, um, uh, in a number of fields, and they get very little coverage um, or, you know, about psychiatric drugs. Uh, and uh, one of them, a mass... Uh, a, a mass uh, suit to stop the drugging of the elderly in Canada with antipsychotic drugs. It got it got no publicity, and mm. I've won uh, been the expert in the first part of dyskinesia case at horrible abnormal movements caused by the antipsychotic drugs. It didn't get anything there, but go back to the '70s when I was doing anti lobotomy mm-hmm. uh, campaign. I was in Canada speaking at universities sometimes and speaking on the some of the top radio and TV. So the shutout has been been virtually around the world. <laughs> the, the one exception is Russian television. Wow, that's so, interesting. Too, too good, funny. good old RT, and, I, and I'm sure that that's, you know, because they love to, they want to go after industry and capitalism in America. Hmm. But they, they do, they've done shows that... Um, uh, that I've been on in shows that I haven't been on that were critical of psychiatric drugs. Yeah. Are there you any know, Russian, so, so are there Russian I, pharmaceutical um, companies? Excuse me? Are there any Russian pharmaceutical companies? I don't know the answer to that. Um, and uh, I don't know how much power they have. I'm under the impression that it's much easier to, to confront these issues. For example, I was told, although I have no evidence by RT, that I'm famous in Russia. <laughs> I have no evidence for that. <laughs> well, and and you also and you also talk about how now how, how when you were a reformist in your in your initial years, even though it sounds like you obviously had more coverage in some ways, obviously a lot a lot of other ways than you do now, but via the web and there there seems to be that you're you're finding a community of people that uh, I, I, that the tide is sort of changing, is it not? I mean, in terms of you, it hasn't always been easy to go against the grain, right? I mean, for you, didn't you initially have, you know, death threats and things like that? Or and has that changed in terms of the general population? Their and well, their response. The threats against me are no longer quite as overt, nor have there been overt actions that I know of. But the threats on all kinds of levels that are frightening and expensive to deal with continue. Mm-hmm. So I like everybody to think I'm very, very rich from doing legal work so that I can um, I can handle whatever's thrown at me. Yeah. But um, the um, uh, in terms of the general it, population, the how- general population has enormously moved in the direction of knowing about how bad psychiatric drugs are, including for children, from personal experience as well as from many people now, in in addition to me, who are blogging about this and writing about it. I mean, the power of the Internet, for example, um, when I wrote my first blog, well, this will be very interesting. I almost never, I haven't talked about this much at all. It'll be very interesting. Um, I felt that the district attorney who um, persecuted, I thought she persecuted Michelle Carter, really went after her. And I, I wrote a blog after the trial saying that um, that in all my cases, including being involved with cases around Columbine and the Aurora Theater shooting where, where dozens of people were wounded or killed, that I'd never seen a DA so vilify anybody in the press and throughout the world, as the assistant DA did in uh, against this uh, helpless and medicated the young Michelle Carter, who was just a lovely human being, by the way. Yeah. She got her, well, even after this happened and she was being attacked, she got her class award for being the person most likely to brighten up your day. Yeah. Now, doesn't that seem odd, given the attacks on her in the media? Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, so I went ahead and I did a um, a blog series on it, on um, Bob Whitaker's um, MIA website. Um, it's, um, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the actual name. I should have that at the very tip of Are my tongue. Are you talking tongue, about Mad in America? The Mad, Mad in America, America website? Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, I've got a great new blog up there about... Uh, 
the three most important things to tell anybody about psych drugs. So mm -hmm. I won't tell you what they are. You got to go look at it on. You can get it through my website. Oh no, no, you have to tell us, please. Nope, nope, nope not gonna. <laughs> so you got it. You got to get. I'm playing. I'm having fun with you. Okay. I, I'm not usually this this uh, relaxed. So I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go on my website, Bregan.com, and you'll find it right away under Frequent Alerts. And you can sign up for Frequent Alerts free. Um, okay. and uh, Or you could go right to, to Mad in America and find the three most important things you could tell anybody about psych drugs. But, um, but I, I would say the three... Uh I would say the three most imper important words I would ever say to them, but that's just my own personal uh, take. What are the take. three I, most important words? I, I would say things. don't use them. But that's, that's just a good one. That's, that's a good just one my own. Three that's, words. That's the best words. possible three words. And then you have to modify and say if you're going to come off from that's dangerous too. Yes. So go slowly. Go go carefully. Yeah. But now, now I, I want to. Yeah. Go ahead. Let I'm me sorry. come back to this Michelle Carter. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote my first blog on it. It got thirty thousand viewers. Wow. Now, that's more than any book of mine, which is another industry that's just been shut down. That's probably more than any book of mine since the, you know, a decade. Wow. So here, one blog, and the whole wow. series got about fifty thousand. Wow. That is and awesome. so we can't. We do reach out. We we can really uh, get to people. Yeah. But that... then I'm going to say one more thing about the what we have to deal with. What I still have to deal with. When that came out, the thirty thousand dollar blog, thirty thousand dollar wish, <laughs> the zero dollar uh, blog, came out for the thirty thousand folks. This nasty DA must have seen the handwriting on the wall that I was eventually going to write about her. Mm -hmm. She went to the judge and, and held a, a basically secret meeting without my being there in which she asked the judge to stop my publishing the blog. Wow. Now, the judge is in Massachusetts, and I think uh, somebody told me in court, he said, uh, well, I don't even know I have jurisdiction like that. But, but the other thing is the only time you do that, that you ever go and do prior restraint on freedom of speech, yeah. and you may not even win then, is if you think something like they're going to, uh, the, the, that the you know, New York Times is going to write when we're going to uh, attack uh, North Vietnam or when right. North Vietnam is uh, doing this or that. I mean, it has to be a national security. Yeah. And the judge just paid no attention at all. He literally paid no attention at all to her yeah, but she... but I, but somebody sent it to me but it wasn't even supposed to come to me and so i wrote about what this <laughs> judge this uh, da was doing and uh, yeah. so the fight goes on i mean it's wow. not like i'm relaxing and not being under the gun wow so it still goes on how do you hold it together when you're dealing with people like this i mean this is a lot of pressure coming back at you how do you hold it together well, first, in the early years, I didn't do it very well. Mm -hmm. I started heavy-duty reform work in 1972 when I took on lobotomy, thinking everybody in the profession would agree with me, and it turned out that every single organization, AMA, APA, even some of the psychology associations, didn't want me calling a treatment unscientific and immoral in the same breath. And that's when the, I realized I was really in for a fight. And that went on for years. Um, but I didn't handle it well then. I had a lot of anger and frustration. Yeah. Despite the success, I never felt that I had any success at all because it was just such a fight. I mean, even though practically every single project was stopped in the world, yeah. it still never felt like a success somehow because... I knew the other side was going to continue trying, and the APA would try, and the AMA would try. Yeah. It's just funny. Yeah. I didn't begin to realize how successful I've been until this year, yeah. which is very strange. Wow. But you know, be, but, because I, I've been dying to sort of ask you that one question, because I sort well, of see you as, uh, you're almost like a Martin Luther King of the psychiatric movement. Well, I that's mean, one of the beginnings is, who are my heroes? Yeah. Nelson Mandela you know, who spent decades in jail yeah. and wouldn't even leave jail in South Africa yeah. by agreeing that he would not be political anymore and he went on to be president. Martin Luther King, 
yeah. Gandhi. Yeah. Um, first, it was, those are the kinds of people that are my heroes. Uh, yeah. Now it includes uh, our founders. Yeah. George Washington, incredibly brave man. Um, that, so the, that's the, the category heroes, I put you in. I put you in that category oh, oh, in the realm oh, of psychiatry. Oh. I, I'm not alone. I mean, you don't get the the term. You don't get called the conscience of psychiatry no. for no reason. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt. What were you going to say? No, no, that's very sweet, and it's a Merry Christmas gift from you, a Happy New Year gift from you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> but then. Um, and this could be really important to the folks who are listening. It could be important for your new year and how you live from now on. <clears throat> I decided to give up being angry at them. Mm-hmm. That when I had to deal with these horrible psychiatrists and other doctors and neurosurgeons and neurologists who were lying about their patients not having diseases caused by drugs, <clears throat> all these people, I realized if I was going to be angry at them, it was going to spiritually corrupt me, wear me out, um, and I probably wouldn't be able to continue. So that, that was one thing. I yeah. think another thing is I've never thought that happiness was the most important thing in the in the world. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of people mistake a good life for a happy life. Yeah. Um, being happy is a gift. It comes along. It doesn't come along. It depends on whether you find your, your soulmate to, I think, a great extent. depends on your health. I've always believed since a kid, and I, I can't exactly tell you why, but I've always believed that you should live by your principles, yeah. not by success. I never expected to be as successful as I've been in, in the reform work, so not by success. I never expected to to be anywhere near successful in probably anything, but but to live your life by the principles you believe in, and that and that seems to help. And the, then the next two things that have helped me in the recent years. Well, I didn't have ginger in my life until 1984 or five. Mm-hmm. So for that first decade, I was lonely, lonely, lonely. Yeah. Um, that was the worst of it. Was probably the lonely worse than the attacks because you yeah. get so isolated. Yeah. But two things that are really important to me. Uh, when I was a young man in the fifties, I was the class agnostic. I was the guy who didn't believe in God, and that was pretty radical in the fifties. I mean, yeah. people didn't think that way. <laughs> right. <laughs> and now I'm even more radical among the people I know because I believe that God has purposes for us. I came to the conclusion through this work that I was doing it under orders, that this is what I was supposed to do. Yeah. And then Ginger has exactly the same idea, and, and she believes that, that uh, she's supposed to be working with me and doing this, and that that's why we were brought together. And so we, we live a very spiritually and God-oriented life. Neither of us goes to—I don't go to temple, she doesn't go to church— but we, we really have that. And what I did with my anger, MK, is I um, I had been, uh, at the time I was single and I was dating a woman who went, went to AA. Mm-hmm. And I learned about AA and I read about it and I realized that a lot of the principles of AA uh, as written, written out in the big book and the little book are, are very similar to what I believe in. And and I gave my anger up to God. I said, God, if I'm going to be angry all the time, I can't handle it. It's going to ruin me. Yeah. I, I won't be able to deal with my life. I have so many things to be angry about, the attacks, the, yeah. the ignoring, the uh, attempts to really hurt me uh, physically, mentally. I, I said, I want, I want you to take care of the anger part. If there's somebody out there who needs somebody to get angry at, you do it. Yeah. And I really worked on it. It didn't come overnight, but I really worked on it. So... For the new year, folks, if you can give up your anger, just give it up. It doesn't work. It isn't good for you. If you're in a personal relationship and you're angry, just talk about being hurt. If yeah. you're in a political relationship with the world and you're angry, just talk about right and wrong. Yeah. So just stay away from anger. It looks terrible on TV, by the way. <clears throat> doesn't look good on the radio. Yeah, it feel and, it feels good when you're doing it, but then you look at yourself and go, "Oh God, what was I doing?" 
you know, no, yeah. no, no. Yeah, and you know, I remember you also. I, I've heard you say something similar in another one of your interviews, and you you talked about. Um, you said I, I decided not to be angry and to get busy, and I like that idea too. That just get busy with reform work or with you know becoming an activist or with working toward change in the best way you can. Is speaking with those who of like-minded yeah. people, finding support, which I think Mad in America uh, is, is a big piece of that. The, Dr. Bregan, Peter Bregenauer is another piece of that. So these, um, we're going we're gonna to have to take a break. We're going to come back, but we are going to talk to Dr. Bregan about, again, the effect of these drugs and what they can do and how they can actually help uh, contribute to the profile of the mass shooter. We'll be right back after these messages. Santa Fe Community College, starting January 2018, will offer a social media specialist certificate. This unique accelerated certificate combines digital communication and online marketing with current web-based social media platforms. The program is fully online, designed for beginners and for those with more experience. All ages are welcome. Learn the tech, the business, and the legal aspects of social media in 16 weeks. For more information, contact Monique Nair at 505-428-1738 or email filminfo at sfcc.edu. Classes start January 16th. I need new piston rings. I need some new snow tires. My car is held together by a piece of chicken wire. In the market for a new car, you could donate your old clunker to KSFR and get a tax receipt, even if it's not running. To learn more, call us at 428-1527. That's 428-1527. Oh, what fun it is to drive this rusty Chevrolet. You are far from home. Great trip, but a little homesick. You want to assuage that anxiety? Use your KSFR app on your cell or tablet and tune in wherever you are to your hometown station, KSFR, to soothe yourself with your favorite music shows, information about your community, and Santa Fe and New Mexico news. Don't have the app? Easy. Go to your Apple or Android Google online store, download the free KSFR app, then feel at home wherever you are. For many reasons now, going to a psychiatrist probably the most dangerous thing you can do in the Western world, other, other than, you know, do something illegal. And that quote comes from Dr. Peter Bregan. He's our host for this show today. And we're talking about the role that antidepressants play in mass shooting. Uh, so far, we've been talking about his extensive background as a reformist and uh, just what the fight is like. Uh, and he's giving us uh, many words of hope. And let's let's talk about the quote we just heard, Dr. Bregan, um, and this notion of you, you, what you often call the exposure I, to psychiatry. I didn't hear the quote. What oh, was the quote? Oh, the quote. Okay, you say um, uh, something close to uh, that. Going to a psychiatrist is, won't be one of the most dangerous things you can do in the Western world. Yeah. That's legal. Yes, well, I've said that in various ways many, many times. Yes. And can you it expound is. on that and why you think that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, a person who goes to a psychiatrist, particularly a psychiatrist because... You know, they have the reputation of where you go when you're in most serious trouble. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you're already in serious trouble, which means you're feeling kind of helpless and you're feeling kind of upset and you're feeling like things are out of control. And you go to a psychiatrist and instead of the psychiatrist saying, hey, you're a good, solid, normal person who's been through a lot of stress and difficulty. I'm confident you and I can find ways to empower you so that you can take over your life. You don't have to feel helpless anymore. And in fact, let's work on even your language so that you begin to talk about yourself in a different way. And we're going to look at how you got to feel helpless and what it's like to just get past that. And, um, and when I do that, Almost always, as I work with the person, they're feeling a lot better after one hour. They're not, you know, they're not over their life troubles, but they found somebody who's going to coach them, help them, understand them, give them some therapy around growing and empowering themselves. I'll even talk about love. I'll say you have, you know, you know, you've shut down on love in your life, and uh, you know, you, we'll work on that. And I sort of tell them what I think is going to happen, which is not that they're going to get over an illness because they don't have one, but they're going to just improve their life and take off. That's my goal. 
and and normalize. You sort of normalize their feelings. Or oh, I mean, the, put it, the feelings but, are inevitable. Many mm-hmm. of these people are inevitable after what they've been through. Mm-hmm. Now imagine the alternative of the psychiatrist. You go to the psychiatrist and you tell him, "I feel like my life's out of control," and he says, "Well, of course it's out of control. You have a biochemical imbalance." Not only is he lying because there is no such thing, he's taping, taking terrible advantage of somebody who has nothing wrong in their brain and telling them they do, which makes them helpless and dependent on him. And the psychiatrist is especially uh, taking advantage because that psychiatrist, 99.9999% of the time, is going to give a drug to the person, and that drug is going to cause a biochemical imbalance, which the person will not be told. That person won't be told, I'm giving you a drug that will give you an alternative reality with distorted biochemical re- reactions in your brain and harm to your brain cells. So it's a tremendous taking advantage of the individual. On top of that, as we look at all of the drugs, they do not work any better than placebo and sometimes worse because they cause so many problems. So they'd be better off just being given hope, which is what I do. A placebo is hope. I give hope. I don't have to give a fake placebo pill. I'm giving, I'm giving the real thing, mm-hmm. giving hope. I've never said it that way before, and I think that's a really good way to look at it. Mm. And all psychiatric drugs are harmful, and over time, they're going to wear down your brain. And you need to try, if at all possible, to get off of them with careful supervision and a good social network. Because they're neurotoxins, and they're not good for your brain in the long run. And there is not not a single study of any merit that shows long-term help from any psychiatric drug. And the short-term help is pretty much blunting your emotions or giving you an artificial high. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, what do you say to... First, I I want to make sure and distinguish your specific specialty, because you talk about being a clinical psychiatrist, which is different than somebody who goes and studies animals or... I mean, in that that you have a specialty where you... In clinical psychopharmacology. Yeah. So can can you tell us exactly what that means so that people understand that when you're talking about this, you really know what you're talking... You're talking about human... The human um, consequences. And can you... Tells, yeah. yeah. Well, in, in addition to being the, the standard sort of psychiatrist where I'm a, uh, a medical doctor with, in my day, we got an internship and, and three years of psychiatric training and the two years at the National Institute of Mental Health after that, um, I've spent my life writing dozens of articles and more than 20 books, most of which deal with um, clinical psychopharmacology, that is the effect of psychiatric drugs and other psychoactive substances on the brain and the mind. So it's, it's also alcohol and it's also uh, a lot of drugs that affect the mind and, and can make people even suicidal. Um, the the uh, real, that the, and, and these are the real life consequences, not studies in a lab with rats or chimps or what these are. These are the studies that are done with, uh, this is, the consequence of real-life use of these drugs. Yeah, I'm doing my work with people rather than animals, but I also enormously cite animal studies. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a laboratory person. I'm a living being with other living beings who's worked since he was 18 years old as a volunteer in a state mental hospital with, with human beings in distress. Mm-hmm. Now, and what do you say to people who say, oh, but these drugs, they've say, you know, there's lots of professional therapists out there that, and, and, and psychiatrists, as you know, uh, I'm sure well aware of, uh, that, that believe that these drugs are correcting a chemical imbalance. Now, why are they misinformed that way, number one? And then number two, what do you say to all the people who say, well, I don't even care. I, these drugs saved my life. I, I am alive because of these drugs. Yeah. Well, first of all, there is no way for somebody to know they're alive because of uh, of drugs, because life keeps coming at us and life keeps changing. And a lot of people who actually say they're alive because of the drugs may be alive because of the hope of the drug, because it's not that the drug doesn't do anything. Drugs and placebo will help about a third and sometimes a half of people just from the placebo effect. 
I, I was going to so, say, haven't they found that, that the placebo effect and the actual drug effect runs at about the same rate? It runs at a, about the same rate. <clears throat> In terms of effectiveness. So, I mean, essentially, you could give everybody placebos and get the same results, couldn't you? Without well, causing yes. the harm. Well, you get, you get much, yes, that's right. Okay, you get much, much better results. But if, um, if you um, actually give the person a drug as a placebo that gives you side effects, like a drug that's going to give you dry mm-hmm. mouth, Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't have any big psychoactive effects, it will outperform the psychiatric drug. <laughs> wow. Because it's a, pl- it's a pl- placebo that convinces the doctor and the patient that it's a real drug. Wow. So the doctor and the patient both rate themselves as imp- uh, rate, rate the patient as improved. Furthermore, most of these damn studies, and it is, they're horrible studies. First of all, they're four to six weeks long. Um, recently, um, a new amphetamine mix, uh, long-acting Adderall, was approved by the FDA after three weeks. Wow. I mean, so that's meaningless. That means nothing about whether it's going to help you or not and wh- what the adverse effects are. So, and let's, and let's, in- let's talk real quick about those adverse effects. What, again, what are they in terms of what, what have you seen in long-term use? Well, there's a common final pathway for all psychoactive substances. So whether you are smoking marijuana or whether you're um, taking enough alcohol to be de- you know, deeply affected by it or whether it's any psychiatric drug or whether you're doing street drugs, <clears throat> as long as you're taking a psychoactive agent, with a certain degree of potency that it will affect you, over time it tends to lead to a flattening of emotions, a loss of interest in oneself. You know, marijuana, uh, very controversial, but you know, back in the 60s, the term deadhead was created, Mm -hmm. and it wasn't for nothing that it was created. And brain shrinkage, right? Many of the drugs actually harm the neurons so badly that they die. Every class of drug has some studies showing shrinkage of the brain over time, including the stimulants, the antidepressants, um, and, and, the uh, benzos. Benzos uh, cause dementia over time. And you've um, also had, um, you've had uh, special access to Eli Lilly's court documents, correct? where you got to look at the, the documented results of, of these kinds of consequences, correct? Well, that's not where those consequences oh. are found. But okay. yes, I have had access to um, Eli Lilly, and um, I was actually the scientific expert for all of their original 150 cases uh, around the country that were against Eli Lilly for violence and suicide. And I've had access to other companies as well doing product liability legal work. That's where the legal work is so valuable, far Mm -hmm. more than any money. Its value is what I can then write about, about these drugs, what I learn about them. Mm -hmm. Um, But what I learned from the Lilly studies was that was my introduction to evil Mm -hmm. in some ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, I never recovered from looking inside Eli Lilly and seeing, for example, that when when they first decided they were going to study the drug and market it as this um, uh, drug that was free of bad effects and just marvelous. Well, the first studies found that it was so harmful to um, volunteers who was making them so agitated and disturbed that the man in charge says, we can't market this as a first-line drug at best if we even get it approved. We're going to have to market it as, you know, what you do in an extreme or something. So they just fired him. Wow. They also found that the the cats they were experimenting on became noticeably angry. Sweet cats they'd known for years got angry and hissed and growled. And sometimes it lasted long after the drug was stopped. And and then they went on and and fought from the very beginning against all the people who were getting violent on the drugs. Uh, Then I found out that when they couldn't... um, get their people to finish 
their studies because the drugs was the Prozac was so agitating and caused so much anxiety. They cheated the government and cheated on their studies and started giving patients benzos to calm them down. Wow. In the studies. And then when they couldn't get their drug approved because the studies were so bad, the government gave them a pass and let them use the studies where the patients were drugged on, on sedatives to make it through. Wow. So the FDA is as evil as anybody else. So wow. that it was very hard. I could talk. I wrote a whole book about that, you know, talking back to Prozac. And yep. uh, it's... Um, it's so disillusioning, you know. I mean, that's another thing that's so hard to handle. Yeah. Uh, beyond the anger is the disillusionment, coming to grips with the disillusionment. Um, I'm going through that now because I've become interested in nutrition. I wrote a little bit about it on, on my website, not a lot. And I've changed my way of eating, and um, my wife has. and We're so much more healthy. And then you look at what's going on, and the... And the the meat companies and the dairy companies and all the other big corporations, they're doing all the same thing the drug companies are doing. Yeah. Our food is in, as industrialized as, as, as our medical care yep. to push crap instead of good approaches. Yeah, absolutely. So and disillusionment everywhere for me. Yeah, well, I think I think uh, you're not alone in that by any means. And, the, you know, this back to the, the them giving benzos on top of uh, of their other drugs, it, that's also often kind of a course of of uh, diagnosis with people as well. Also, right, they start, they can start on an, an antidepressant and then, and or they can start on like Adderall. The, I've read about a lot of cases like this where they start them on Adderall, kids, ADHD, ADHD, oh, he's got the diagnosis, ADHD, put him on Adderall, now he's all sped up, and before long he starts having uh, other agitations or mood swings, and now he's got a second, a secondary diagnosis, bipolar, now we've got to add some mood stabilizers in there, oh, now their anxiety is off the roof, and, and now we've got to add some, you yeah. know, benzos in there, and by the time they're done, some of these kids in their 20s are on six different drugs that are all not just interact, you know, <laughs> yeah. not just having their own effects, but then potentially interacting. And are these are they even tested for drug interaction? I mean, no, these... and there's no way to really test for them. I mm -hmm. mean, they're it's all experimenting on human beings as guinea pigs. Yeah. And uh, Ginger and I have been following up. That's my wife, Ginger, and I've been following up some of the studies haphazardly that are appearing about the children who in the 70s first got. Yeah. Small doses of um, of <clears throat> relatively small R by, by today's standards of Ritalin and then followed them up. And now statistically significant numbers are on multiple psychiatric drugs. They're not taking stimulants anymore. It yeah. became a gateway drug by that process that MK that you just described. Yeah. Yeah, multiple, <clears throat> and, and, and on <clears throat> top of that, now we've also got kids pulling off of that going into heroin. When they can't get access to yes. their parents' kids, I, I talked to a woman today whose children, both of her children, uh, got addicted to her prescription drugs, and then they pulled off, they, yeah. she ran out of them in the cabinet, and then they turned to heroin. So this opioid ex yeah. epidemic, I think, is even potentially tied into these drugs, not just the muscle and relaxants, but the, the antipsychotic drugs that yeah. were, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to... And Kate, uh, let, me, let me redirect something, yes. which I'm sure you're going to like, which is <clears throat> you kind of advertise the show as being around mass murderers. So let me make a few remarks on that. Yeah. So you that know what, Dr. Bregan, let me tell you real quick, we have about four minutes Unfortunately, okay, okay. I'll give you a simple example. Eric Harris, the shooter from Columbine, he was originally put on Zoloft a couple of years earlier, and he had a bad reaction, so they changed him to Luvox, another SSRI antidepressant. And at that point in time, there's no evidence that he was a violent, crazy youngster. He had some obsessive thoughts and anxiety. He stays on the Luvox with increasing doses until the, as he gets crazier and more, by, more manic and more psychotic and more paranoid, all things that Luvox famously does to young people. It's, uh, I've written about that as being a drug that in particular we've got literature on it doing to young people. And then he's taking it on the day of the murder, he's taking it right on up until the day he commits all these horrible murders with his, with his uh, compatriot, um, his friend. And 
he killed, they, they killed themselves. And the coroner's office releases his blood test and, and, um, and also the drug company sends the results to the FDA, which I managed to find and, and get. And, and it says, it's so ironic, Eric Harris was on a, quote, therapeutic dose mm -hmm. of the antidepressant Luvox at the time of his death. Oh. So then out comes USA Today with some sort of, a, you know, a 10 year or whatever it was, review of Eric Harris and those murders. And and it says we now without documentation, we now know that Eric Harris wasn't taking any psychiatric drugs at mm. all at the time of the uh, violence. Wow. So I write him and I say, well, look, here's the FDA ID number. Here's yeah. the uh, all the materials. We know with certainty he had a, quote, therapeutic level on his blood, yeah. meaning he very recently took it. Yep. And they never responded to my letter or my wow. communications or my facts. Back and to so that big lie is out there. Back to why we're not hearing about it. Right. And and yes. and, and, and and we got a minute left. Um we don't want to say necessarily every single one of these mass shooters, but what percentage would you say of these mass shooters are, are taking these psychiatric drugs? And do you account for that having an influence on their, on their mass shooter profile? The vast majority have been through the psychiatric system, the vast majority, which is humiliating and degrading, and it shows that beefing up psychiatry is not going to prevent these uh, outbreaks of mass violence because the vast majority have been through and have had psychiatric drugs. It's unclear because the data is, 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 is obliterated a lot of the time what percentage of these violent people are on it at the time and under the influence, but it's certainly at least half and maybe more, I would say. Yeah, and, and, and stigma alone, as you said at the very beginning of the show, yeah.